Kimra Hall Huludunia. Falcha Gu, Ye Old Scott, the Celtic Podcast. On today's show, we'll talk about King Arthur in our Celtic history segment, Celtic headhunters in everyday Celtic ways, and hear f- music from the Merry Plowboys, a Scottish fiddler named Bonnie Rideout, Gaelic Storm, and Kepper Cayley. And as always, a little Irish trivia to test your knowledge to start off, and that is... The first immigrant to enter the United States via Ellis Island was a 15-year-old girl. What was her name? All right. Our first song of the show was a favorite of mine, God Save Ireland, performed by the Merry Plowboys. High on the gallows trees, one noble heart and free, by the vengeful tyrant stricken in their bloom. But they met him face to face With the courage of their race And they went with souls and daunted to their doom God save Ireland, said the heroes God save Ireland, said they all Whether on the scaffold high Or the battlefield we die Oh, what matter if for Ireland do we fall Girt around with cruel foes And their courage proudly rose For they thought of friends who loved them far and near Of the millions true and brave Or the ocean's swelling wave And the friends of dear old Ireland ever true God save Ireland, said the heroes God save Ireland, said they all Whether on the scaffold high or the battlefield we die Oh, what matter if for Ireland dear we fall Climb they up the rugged stair, bang their voices out in prayer Then with England's fatal cord around them pass Close beside the gallows tree, kissed like brothers lovingly True to home and faith and freedom to the last God save Ireland, said the heroes God save Ireland, said they all Whether on the scaffold high or on the battlefield we die Oh, what matter if for Ireland dear we fall Never till the latest day shall the memory pass away Of their gallant lives both given for our land but on the cause we'll go, it's the joy, the weal and woe, till we make our isle a nation free and grand. God save Ireland, said the heroes, God save Ireland, said they all. Whether on the scaffold high or the battlefield we die, oh what matter if for Ireland do we fall. God save Ireland, said the heroes God save Ireland, said they all Whether on the scaffold high or the battlefield we die Oh, what matter if for Ireland do we fall That was in two, me and my brothers We went to a place called Taylor's Irish Knights and we got to see them play It was unbelievable, it was awesome now, it's time for a little Gaelic. Hi, I'm Tom. I'm fucking much back in Gaelic. It's time to try a little Gaelic. Today, we will discuss the past tense of the verb to be. And as always, I will display on screen what I am discussing. Tasha Kishin, let's begin. <clears throat> the past tense of the verb to be. Now, the independent form is va. And a dependent form is ro. Like the present tense, these are used to provide the four distinct forms of the past tense of the verb to be. Va, B-H-A, for positive statements. Va e fur, it was cold. Ka ro, for negative statements. Ha ro e fur, it was not cold. And ro for asking a question, an interrogative. And ro e fur, was it cold? And knock ro for a negative question, a negative interrogative. Knock ro e fur, wasn't it cold? Now, when answering these, 
In Gallic, there's no simple saying yes and no. Gallic has no single word for either of those. The positive or negative forms of the verb need to be used in responding to any question. And let me give you an example. In the present tense, Avelu fluke, are you wet? Now the answer to that would be either yeah, you are or you're not. Ha mi fluke, I am wet. Or hanyo mi fluke, I am not wet. See how you don't just simply say yes or no? Okay. But you are answering in the affirmative or not. I'll give you another example. Nakael iet ard, aren't they tall? And the answer would be ha iet ard, they are tall, or hanyo iet ard, they are not tall. In past tense, it would go like this. In Roshiv Trang, were you busy? And of course the answer would be Va Mi Trang, I was busy, or Haro Mi Trang, Trang, I was not busy. Let me give you another example. Nakro Ilashk, wasn't she lazy? Va uh, Ilashk, she was lazy. Haro Ilashk. She was not lazy, or wasn't she lazy? She was not lazy. You see how the uh, past tense of the verb to be follows the same rules as the present tense. Now I'm going to give you an exercise. I'm going to give you six uh, quick sentences to translate from Gaelic to English, and I'll read them out to you. Va'iet gle holache. Haro e roshnok and ro eat ski avail e chiro nakro am fear leshk va e trang agas toleche va and la fluch ach bla and they'll do it. Thank you for tuning in to Fekimich Beck and Gaelic.
And she can reach across the ocean deep And break my heart in two Mary's Eyes by Gaelic Storm, or Gaelic Storm, this is an Irish band. Um, I haven't really heard a whole lot of Ga Gaelic Storm stuff, but I like it. That's off their uh, Tree album, and uh, yeah, I'm starting to like these guys. Now, we will delve into the rich history of our Celtic past in our segment, The Celtic History Break. Today's topic, King Arthur, Defender of Britain Against the English. One of the few things known about the legendary King Arthur, based on scraps of history, is that he was a Celtic leader of Britain when it was still a Celtic land. A staunch Christian, he was said to have fought 12 battles throughout Britain around 500 AD, becoming the Breton hero for his stand against the pagan Saxons and other Germanic peoples invading the island. Arthur eventually died in battle against them. Yet the resistance of other Celts following his example denied much of Celtic Britain to the invaders for 50 years or more, and most of Wales and Cornwall for centuries. The legend of Arthur, originating in the kind of imaginative Celtic energy that created the Irish heroic sagas, established him as a supremely valorous Christian knight and Celtic king of Britain, who led his mounted warriors against the enemies of his country. Over the years, the legend grew in complexity while becoming one of Europe's most loved and famous stories. English, French, and German writers added to the original story, yet in every respect and in every version, Arthur continues to resemble the classic Celtic hero who had been created and idealized throughout Europe and Celtic society for centuries in the past and perpetuated, perpetuated, okay, scratch all that, and perpetuated by them and by others in imitation for centuries to come. Now, this is when I wish I could, I could do voices, but Winston Churchill said of King Arthur the legend, we find ourselves in the presence of a theme as well-founded, as inspired, as an inalienable from the inheritance of mankind as the Odyssey or the Old Testament. It is all true, or ought to be, and more and better besides. And whenever men are fighting against barbarism, tyranny, and massacre for freedom, law, and honor, let them remember that the fame of their deeds, even though they themselves be exterminated, may perhaps be celebrated as long 
as the world rolls around. Let us declare that King Arthur and his noble knights, guarding the sacred flame of Christianity and the theme of a world order, slaughtered innumer innumerable hosts of foul barbarians and set decent folk an example for all time. Now, ironically, when Winston Churchill speaks of the foul barbarians, he's speaking about the Anglo-Saxons that were in the process of becoming the English themselves. So it's a little bit of irony there. Now, some of the famous Arthurian characters in various versions of King Arthur's story, you know, that, were, that was elaborated by the British, the French, and the German writers, says he was born the illegitimate son of a Breton, Celtic king of Britain and raised in secrecy. Withdrawing a sword embedded in a stone proved his right to the throne, and he reigned in his court at Camelot with his queen Guinevere, attended by his court magician Merlin, a modern druid for his time, the processor of a miraculous sword Excalibur, given him by the mysterious Lady of the Lake. Arthur became known as a noble king and great warrior. Among his enemies were his nephew Mordred and his sister Morgan Le Fay, and evil sorcerers who plotted to win Arthur's throne for herself and her lover. Two of the more noble characters who sat at Arthur's famous round table were the knights Sir Lancelot of the Lake and Sir Tristan, both become involved in tragic love affairs, Lancelot with King Arthur's Queen Guinevere and Tristan with Isolde. The Irish queen of Tristan's Welsh uncle, King Mark of Cornwall. Wow. In the Arthurian medieval world, chivalric code and courtly romance demanded that young gentlemen were to fall in love with unattainable virgins or married ladies. Only after suffering months of silence could they proclaim their love, then prove it by performing noble deeds and quests. Sir Galahad, Percival in some versions, became the hero of the quest for the Holy Grail. And I will get into that at a different time. And that is your Celtic History Break. Ja, die Karsch, ja, die 
Now that was a Gallic mashup, two songs for the price of one. The first was Foscal and Doris, and the second was Mian Vui Rua by Capricaley. I love Capricaley and Karen Matheson, she's an, a tremendous singer. She does a lot of solo stuff. So if you're looking for some good Celtic music, that, that'd be a good place to look. And now it's time for Everyday Celtic Ways, a look into how our Celtic heritage is still very much part of our everyday lives. Today on Everyday Celtic Ways, we will talk about Celtic headhunters, which is possibly one of the coolest subjects I've ever researched. Now, if I had to choose one thing about the Celts that they're most famous for, it would probably be the fact that they were headhunters. They believed that the greatest prize in battle was their enemy's head. This could come from the fact that the Celts had a religion where they believed that the person's soul lived inside their heads. To the Celts, having a collection of heads was a sign of great honor and prestige. Plus, it gave them bragging rights. Thus, they would even go as far as to decorate their saddles and the doors of their houses with the severed heads of their enemies. The Celts would brag about owning the severed head of a very powerful enemy leader. The fact of losing your head for the enemies was a powerful motive to keep peace with the Celts. Now, on the shores of Loch Auk, near Invergary in the Scottish Highlands, sits the striking and slightly curious Well of the Seven Heads. It's a tall, needle-like monument and it's topped by a sculpture of a hand holding a dagger and seven severed heads. Now, when I first saw this, I had to know the story behind it. Because that's a, that's a stark reminder of one of the most gruesome episodes in Scottish clan history. And not a well-known event to even some of the Scots that live nearby there today. Now, while visiting Scotland in 2002, our guide had no idea of the story. He even scoffed at the idea that the Scots could be that violent. Until, that is when we reached the monument along the roadside that he had driven past probably hundreds of times in his lifetime and never even knew its history. See, warfare among the clans was commonplace in the 16th and 17th centuries, but this was a bloody tale of internal strife among, among different sections of one of the largest clans in the Highlands, the McDonald's. I believe that there's seven different divisions of the McDonald's. You know, McDonald's of Glengarry, the McDonald's of Sleet, the McDonald's of Kepok, you know, it just goes on and on. What is striking about the different, about the story of the Will of the Heads is the overwhelming sense of vengeance and power masquerading as justice, which typified the clan system at that time, and over which the authorities in Scotland had no control. In somewhat typical Highland fashion, though, the story begins with a fight that gets out of hand. On September 25th, 1663, Alexander, the 13th chief, chief of the Kepak family, powerful members of the McDonald's, and his brother Ranald, were killed by their cousins at a brawl in the mansion of Inch, just outside the village of Roy Bridge. The two Kepak men had just returned from schooling in France and had thrown a rather grand party. One theory behind their argument is that their cousins began mimicking their French accents and mannerisms and the situation escalated. Others claimed the killers had been set up by more prominent members of the clan to rid them of an unpopular reforming clan chief. Whatever the truth, the upshot was that two leading clan members lay dead. The killers were well known, Alexander MacDonald and his six sons from Inverlair near Roy Bridge. They had been engaged in an argument with the Kepoks over a piece of land, 
which undoubtedly contributed to the killings. But in a part of the country dominated by the McDonald's, they had many sympathizers, particularly among, among ordinary people who regarded the Kepak boys as gentry, a little snooty. Time passed and no justice was meted out, but vengeance brewed within one man, Ian Loam, or Bald Ian as he was known a kinsman of the victims, and an important figure who held the title of Gallic Poet Laureate of Scotland. He was known locally as the Kepok Bard. Bald Ian embarked on a seeming one-man crusade to make the McDonald's at Inverlair pay for what had happened. He first approached a fellow clansman, the Lord MacDonald of Glengarry and Oros, who at the time was regarded by the Scots Privy Council as High Chief of all the Clan Clan Donald. You see, it's the whole clan is called Clan Donald. When you say Mac or Mick, I mean son of. That's yeah. But MacDonald did not want to get involved. His next stop was Sir James MacDonald of Sleet, but he too was hesitant to become involved in the affairs of a fellow tribe. But Bald Ian had a trump card up his sleeve. The two murdered men had been fostered with Sir James at Duntome Castle on the Isle of Skye. The vengeful bard traveled to the castle and appealed to the chief's emotion in dramatic and some say biblical language. This is a direct quote from the scribe at the castle. Ian Loam, I'm sorry, uh, Bald Ian is quoted as saying, Abel is cold and his blood is crying in vain for vengeance. Cain is hot and red-handed and hundreds are lukewarm around him as the black goat's milk. And that's what he told Sir James. His ploy was successful. Sir James applied to the Privy Council in Edinburgh which issued letters of fire and sword against the killers. Sir James' brother Archibald, the warrior poet, was put in charge of 50 men who were sent to avenge the killings of two years previously. So it took him two years to get justice for this. Bald Ian was there to guide them to the McDonald's home at Inverlair, where, after a brief struggle, the seven known killers, and probably more, were murdered and decapitated. The Baird was satisfied. He had his revenge, and he wanted to prove it. He wrapped the severed heads in his plaid, tied them together with willow rods, and set out for Glengarry. Before presenting them to Lord MacDonald at Edinburgh Castle, Bald Ian stopped to wash them in the waters of Loch Auch, at the site where the grim obelisk now stands. The heads were then sent to Edinburgh, where they were affixed to the gallows, between Edinburgh and Leith. The monument At the side of the road, A82 was erected in 1812 by then Chief of the Clan MacDonald. The story was by this time verified by the exhumation of a mound on the lands of Inverlair. The mound revealed at least seven headless corpses. Bald Ian had got his bloody vengeance after all. A dark story of the clan feuds jealousy, and ultimately retribution in fine Celtic fashion. And that's it for Everyday Celtic Ways. Well, that's it for today's show. I hope you liked it. Trying to keep it interesting, informative, and fun. For me, anytime you can infuse something Celtic into your day, it's a good day. Now, I've got about five or six of these uh, shows in the can, and I'm starting to promote them on Facebook and other places. And if you see it, and you listen to it, and you like it, let people know about it. Spread it around. And um, make sure you comment. If you have a comment, if you want certain songs played, or you want me to track them down for you, or if you need any information on anything, just give me a comment. Also, like it and subscribe, because that's how YouTube builds an audience. They, they build an audience because the more this thing gets out there, the more they can advertise, the more money they make. Uh, oh, yeah, the trivia question. I almost forget. Almost, I forget this almost every time. The trivia question. The first Irish immigrant to enter the 
America through Ellis Island was 15-year-old Annie Moore. Martian leave in Drasda. Bye for now. I'll leave you with this song, Nightmarica, a lovely Scottish fiddle tune from Body Rideout. Now, Bonnie, she's a, a, the only American to hold the honor of representing Scottish fiddle music at the prestigious Edinburgh International Festival. She is the first woman to hold the National Scottish Fiddle title and the youngest to have garnered the U.S. championship, winning it three consecutive years. Bonnie has uh, discontinued competing to become an adjudicator, a judge, and professional recording artist, and uh, has maintained a consistently high profile in the Celtic music scene for almost 30 years. And uh, I, I know I met her at the uh, Scottish Festival in Arlington, Texas, if, probably about almost 15 years ago. Uh, but she's uh, had to stop touring due to being diagnosed with MS. But she still plans to make more music, which is good. My hopes and prayers go out to her. and So check her out and check her music out. You can uh, see everything you need to know about her at bonnierideout.com. Thank you. 